Hello and good morning. To Eat Your Backyard, my YouTube channel, where I try to help you create your own fruit jungle. Sometimes we look at native plants as well. If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Turn on the notifications, that way, as I stream, you will be notified. And this is something I've been wanting to do for a while, and I decided to finally put it into action. This is the first time I've streamed from this particular location, so I apologize ahead of time if I lose connection, but we'll see how it goes. All right, so today I'm actually going to get in it. I'm going to get in the water, and we're going to wade around. And anytime you're going to wade around in the water in Florida, you probably want to shuffle your feet because there are stingrays everywhere. And you do not want well, maybe you do want to, but I don't want to step on a stingray. If you've ever seen a grown man stung by a stingray, you will know that crying is the first order of business. It is one of the most painful things you can imagine. That being said, let's get right in here. What we're going to do is look at Some mangrove trees, and you can see they're everywhere. That they grow directly in the water. So there are mangrove forests all over the world. And in Florida, they've been impacted pretty heavily by development, of course. But there's a lot of attention on bringing them back. And along causeways and so on and so forth is like the location I am at here. And by the way, as I wade through this very muddy, murky water, it's been just blowing like crazy for days, I am shuffling my feet, dragging them along the bottom. And it gets pretty deep right here. <laughs> I'm already up to knee high. I thought this was going to be super shallow. Look at that. The pelican knows what's up. Oh no, there's a cormorant. I am on the uh, southern side of a causeway that runs north, runs east-west. And we have a north wind, a cold front passed through here not that long ago. So we're getting ready to feel what we would consider cooler temperatures in Florida down in the 70s. It's kind of a bummer how dirty this water is. Since I kind of got stalled on wrapping around that one mangrove, I don't really feel like going for a swim to get around it. I'll try around this way, but since we're at it, you know, everything we do, and I don't want to preach to anybody because that's boring, but, you know, whatever we do affects everything else, right? We know that. Nobody needs to tell you that, but... When I think of, you know, how, what do I do in my day-to-day -day in terms of being into growing things that would help if I want to see, you know, more clear water like this? Well, one of the main things is the fertilizer, to be very responsible in the application of fertilizers. Hey, squids. Thank you. Yeah, it is beautiful water. It could be more clear, though. could be more clear. I'm in about... Uh, three inches of water here and I'd say this is maybe a foot of visibility. Let's see if it's sh shallow around this way. But one of the things that makes, one of the many things, it's not just one thing, that makes the river here, the Indian River Lagoon, become more, more cloudy is the excess of nitrogen, the excess of fertilizers in the water. And uh, so, you know, that that can come from fertilizing lawns and so on. So when I fertilize my lawn, I use a what I consider to be a very effective um, granular fertilizer that I apply lightly and I water in lightly so that it has time to be absorbed by the plants. If any of it gets on the sidewalk or the street, I sweep it up like I would sweep up dust on the, on the floor of my house and I uh, reapply it on the lawn. 
but then I make sure it gets watered in. That cool boy five, hey. Could palm trees drown? Actually, here's some palm trees, and yes, they can drown. Meaning they can just kind of be, uh, you know, overtaken by the erosion. And always a good example of a palm tree. You can see this one's got a dead top on it. That's a sable palm that's reached the end of its experience, but it's far too young to die this young. But look, it's had its roots eroded away at the base. And eventually, they kick the bucket. They can do pretty well in this brackish environment, but you can see right next to it, that's what the healthy version looks like. Yeah, beautiful with that north wind blowing in the top of it. You can never get over the blueness of the Florida sky. Now, okay, I tried to round this mangrove here. I do not want to step on, say, I don't know, a hypodermic needle. I don't know what's back here. <laughs> I'm from New Jersey, so I'm thinking this could happen. Actually, where I grew up in New Jersey, we go down to the shore, it was not uncommon to find hypodermic needles on the beach. Medical waste. Yeah, so I'm shuffling around the edge here. Maybe I'll get to see a stingray to show you, hopefully not connected by a stinger to my foot. Do I think about stingrays too much? Well, depends on what you mean by too much. I can tell you the sound that a person makes after being stung will stay with you. Okay, this is interesting. This almost looks like lemongrass. Are there piranhas? That famous girl look. No piranhas. But we have things like piranhas here, I think, which are snapper, but they don't swarm on you and eat you up, but they have snapping little mouths. They, they'll want nothing to do with me. Uh, the dangers here, this is a brackish saltwater lagoon. The dangers here include certainly stingrays at the top of the list because of their incredibly venomous stingers and tendency to sting you. Another thing that is very common right here are bull sharks and they love this murky water and they can come in right up to this shallow. So, you know, if I was going to pick things to worry about, it would those two are on the top of my list, bull sharks and stingrays. If I wanted to go even farther, uh, I suppose you could say a snake or two, but um, you know, there's a number of things once you get into the food chain like this that can get you. <laughs> I guess we could think of lots of toothy critters. There are plenty of venomous stinging things. Even the catfish here, you know, I grew up with freshwater catfish, but saltwater catfish are a whole other deal. They have spines on them, and the sting is something like that stingray sting I was telling you about. So anyway, that's what's kind of rolling here. I'm almost beyond, I can keep going, but I, I wanted to see if this was bizarre. Yeah, definitely not lemongrass. I was like, it's impossible that lemongrass could be growing in salt water. All right, so what you do is when you're going around in these areas is, yeah, Roblox Nation, like a palm would grow, yeah, it's an areca palm. Yeah, I, there are a lot of areca palms growing within a baseball throw of this location. Certainly. All right. Still above water. Interesting. Even over salt water, nature finds a way. I'm just trying to identify some of these plants that are growing up here. There's a whole mishmash of them. Uh, I'm happy that I don't see a Brazilian pepper. And I'm not exactly sure what this is. Sometimes you can find edibles that people have planted down next to these locations. And I don't know what this is. I don't think it's an edible, but what I call gorilla landscaping, where people go and just plant fruit trees all over, you know, Johnny Appleseed, you've heard that story. There's also Johnny Papaya Seed and uh, Sally Sago Palm. <laughs> it's funny, if you start growing all these things in your yard, like so many people have, I love the 
pallet there. You know, eventually you're like, what do I do with 10 mango trees? You know, you could sell them, uh, you can give them away. Well, another option is you can plant them in the wild. And that has been done, believe me, over and over and over. You know, the ethical uh, component of that, I don't think that's for me to wonder about. <laughs> but I'm just saying, I find fruit everywhere. Saw a tamarind tree right on the beach, sand in the Caribbean. Wow, that's so cool. Yeah, some plants will take that salt, says David the Good. I would agree with you. And anything that we're seeing within eye shot here can take that salt. I don't know if you can see over on the far bank there. That probably would have been the better spot for me to try to set up camp. Because I know it's super shallow in there. Maybe the next time I come do this, I'll do that. So I can. What I wanted to do was walk right inside the mangroves. Because it's like a mini canopy and you can really get up in there. And there are a lot of cool fish that live up there snook redfish snapper that you can see also the stingrays and the catfish of course are there as well but if you shuffle your feet along the bottom they'll generally get out of the way and i'm not seeing anything particularly interesting beyond the mangroves i mean it's all interesting but Oh, I can see. No, I don't see any pine right here, but there are pine on the far bank. There's actually uh, what they call ironwood in Hawaii. Or, uh, yeah, there's actually pine trees on the far bank, but not on this causeway here. Okay. Being very careful not to step on broken glass. Ah. Get the day started all right. We found a monster. Not really. Dead horseshoe crab. Now that's a special kind of disgusting in terms of the smell. This is where you're glad you don't have smell-o-vision, but that is a horseshoe crab. Dead one. They do a lot of uh, running around in these shallows, that's for sure. We see them constantly. I have a flats boat. I actually have a fishing channel called Florida Fishy Finger, if you're interested on YouTube, where we go out there and we see a ton of the horseshoe crabs mating, piled on top of each other. But what you can see, ah, this is good. This is what I was hoping for, to be able to show some of the structure of the plants back here, the trees. You can kind of get a gist for how the mangroves operate. Now this is one of three varieties of mangroves that grow back here very commonly. But what you see are roots growing up. I probably should have called that this video that roots growing up. But, oh yeah, David the Good, you, t you think I should take that uh, that horseshoe crab home and make it some, you know, give it back to the garden, so to speak? <laughs> that is such a bold endeavor. I'll tell you, with a five-gallon bucket, I'm not beyond it. But without it, I just can't see interacting with that thing. If The smell of a rotting horseshoe crab is uh, quite possibly among the top worst smells. Imagine you see poison ivy. Yeah, it's <laughs> a good point, Gamer Girl. Uh, if I see poison ivy, I would be very surprised. I'm less surprised to see another pallet. I've actually had a lot of experience with poison ivy and never suffered itchiness from it. So I don't know, I, I think my skin is somewhat okay with it. But yeah, so you can imagine these vertical roots, they provide an incredible place for larval fish. So there are big predatory snook that come in right up in these shallows and they will charge in at these bait fish and you know we watch them we've watched them for years we watch them from our skiff which they hardly even know we're there so it's incredible but uh yeah the little bait fish they can go back up here and, and have a, a refuge from those predators from the monstrous fish that roam about 
trying to uh, eat them. Which is why these trees are so integral to the, it's funny, I look down here and go, oh no, it's a snake at my foot. No, it's not a snake. Yeah, they're very important, right? For a lot of reasons. Of course, they're doing the work. They're doing the cleaning of of the water. Yeah, XXX games. Have I seen any turtles? Uh, occasionally, we see a sea turtle up here in the lagoon. Occasionally, in the ocean, it's almost. When is there a day I don't see a turtle? There are so many turtles in this area because they breed here. They lay their eggs up on the beach that they're very uh, common to see, although I'm told they're endangered, the green and the loggerhead turtles. I've taken boat trips, you know, do offshore fishing, and we run up close to the beach on clear days, and uh, I'm not even kidding that you would see a hundred turtles on the bottom or swimming around a mile. <laughs> Gigantic turtles, I mean, the kind that are, you know, four feet long shell. So yeah, a lot of turtles. Back in this brackish water, sometimes you'll see other smaller turtles, like you know, leatherback uh, snapping turtles or that kind of thing, but less common. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. There's a path that goes back here too. All right, let's see. Yeah, you know, I find these places to be incredibly interesting. They are the, the corners of the of our world. They are the little nooks and crannies of our world. And of course, when you get off the beaten track, get into the dangerous track. There's another rotten horseshoe crab. This is seeming like a bad day for horseshoe crabs, but rest assured that, ah, look at this. Look at this. Okay. I'm into it. Ooh, maybe we'll see a critter. I can't do the stingray shuffle here because there's so many roots. Ugh. What the heck is that? It's charming. Gigantic piece of a door or something. Looks like it's the hatch of a boat, maybe. Oops. Okay. Well, there's quite a nice little path back here. Interesting. Yeah, I don't want to know what's in that water. <laughs> Good comment, gamer girl. I feel the same way. I mean, I do and I don't. I want to know all the good things, but, uh, you know, I'd rather not encounter the, the more consequential. All right. Yeah. yeah. That's, well, it keeps on going. Keep on walking. This is very typical of the growing pattern of these mangroves, is that they, they come out, they provide this overhang, the shade, the roots. Larval fish can go in there. Generally, you'll see larger predatory fish patrolling the outskirts and then out in the open too. But, you know, this is where they can corner those little fish. So, they love it. Let's see if I can see under here. Yeah, the water's just too, too murky. I'll come back out and do another stream on a day when, when uh, the water is more clear because there are a lot of days when it is clear, especially lately with the whole COVID and it just seems like the water got more clear. I don't know what the correlation is there, but you know, maybe, oh, who knows. All right, going back in past the what lies beneath. Well, we got to find out what this thing is, don't we? But if you lift up the lid, you also come to terms with what is beneath it. Ah, there's a little fish. But I can't resist. 
Oh, that's a TV. That's a TV. Yeah, flat screen TV. Suboptimal disposal location for the flat screen TV. <laughs> oh no. It's like uh yeah. So here's the moment I think I'm at. If I claim I like a clean environment and there are, I don't want to step on the old spikies. I don't know if you notice, but there is a medieval quality to these spikes, and they have this long of the horseshoe crab. Don't step on that. But if I really like the environment, then it'd probably be better to do something rather than just virtue signal on a live stream on the internet. Like, what would stop me from coming back here with a garbage bag and kind of cleaning some of this stuff up? Oh, look at that. There's a hinge. Yeah. By the way, I've got a truck. I could easily drag that TV into the truck and take it to the dump. That's right, Squids. We're in a bad situation. We do need Jack here. If Jack were here, he would know exactly what to do. He's very uh, pragmatic in his ability to see the world. He would know exactly what to do with that TV. He'd probably say something like, yeah, let's throw it away. Let's get it out of here so we don't have trash in the place we love. So, yeah, you want to save the world? Save the world right under your feet. <laughs> oh, there's a jumping fish. I don't know if you saw that. Have I ever grown mangroves? Itchio, thank you for that, that question. Uh, Yes, I have grown the mangroves, the kind of long... Here's a mangrove bean, from, not from the type we were just seeing, but from a different type. This mangrove seed, they drop by the hundreds of thousands and are washed out through the inlets in the river out into the ocean, and uh, they sprout very easily. And as a matter of fact, one of the things people like to do, and we could plant one, but it has almost no chance of survival just because we won't care for it but um, the way to plant them I didn't expect to do this but thanks for the comment is like this you just basically find a spot and jam them in now that one's not going to grow obviously because it's not jammed in far enough but they'll grow they sprout out two leaves that come out and they just start to go and if they're in the right place they'll grow rather rapidly and a lot of people who live along the uh the river here have, have done that, have planted them along their seawalls, and, and they come in very strong. Are there coconuts? Famous girl asks, falling in that area. Yes, there are. As a matter of fact, lots of coconuts in this area. Uh, where I'm at is right near a very skinny like interior barrier island, I would call it, within a barrier island, and there are a number of mango orchards and coconut trees. I, like you can see, there's, let me see if I can point one out, I see about 10 of them within eyesight. Oops, a little refocus, is it? You see that thing sticking up there? Above everything else, that's a coconut tree. And I guarantee it is loaded because that one is up beyond easy picking range. And once they get up beyond pick, easy picking range around here, they're basically just, most people are just letting them drop bombs, those coconut bombs. And, and uh, if they're anywhere near the river, which a lot of these coconuts are near the river, like if you see these houses here, you probably can't, but there are coconut trees growing all along them. They just drop them right into the, into the water. Well, actually, the, I'm wearing shorts today. It's about almost probably almost 80 degrees right now it's getting up there quickly it felt cool this morning i actually put on a jacket you know this is a moment in florida where you go, oh yeah i can finally wear my jacket yeah because you don't get much time so everybody looks forward to wearing jackets i don't know if you're from florida you already know that but if you're not this is a thing here <laughs> and uh yeah i think for me too yeah i wore that jacket and i was out on the beach and it was kind of chilly this morning did a surf report on uh, surf all day 1a and 
yeah now i'm ready to take that jacket off it's way too hot as soon as that sun gets up it's looking beautiful but yeah occasionally coconut will float by in the river we see them in the ocean all the time washing up on the beach and what people do i was talking about that gorilla landscaping oh thanks big cat yeah good to see you big cat yeah um thank you it is a cool spot but what people do with the coconuts I found is they will just take them and put them in places. So up in the dunes, this is a popular thing to do, I think, is to take coconuts and just place them on the, on the dune, in the dunes. And, you know, eventually they'll sprout, some of them will, and grow, and you'll have coconuts in the dunes. It's one of the easiest possible trees to grow. I did a video about a month ago where I found a coconut washed up on a very surfy day at the end of my street and it was covered with what I call butterfly clams which are these clams that uh, when they hit the water they fan out in these butterfly fans and uh, yeah so it had been floating in the ocean for a long time is what that means for the enough time for those clams to get to the size they were floating around riding on that coconut it could have rode all the way here from Africa or Portugal or who knows where I love that idea so I took it and I've got it sitting in my yard. And the way I planted it is I just submerge it like an inch into the soil and just let it sit there. And eventually it'll throw down a taproot or it won't. But if it does, wow. What's the story of that coconut? I remember when I was a kid, I watched a, a movie in uh, elementary school that... <laughs> now the, the coconuts are really easy to start, actually. Yeah, I'm going to do a, a couple videos on that with the folks that I'm starting to interact with over at that local plant cell place but I saw this movie as a kid that was essentially it was like an Inuit you know a boy up in a, you know the Arctic somewhere and he carved a kayak like a little fishing kayak thing with a person in weighted it and, went, and floated it out in the ocean and the whole rest of the movie was following this little kayak all around it floated all around the world past shipping lanes different countries ended up floating into like New York Harbor but that idea fascinated me and it always stayed with me and the idea of like this coconut washing up from far away, a message in a bottle, call it what you will. I love it. Yeah, so coconuts are pretty easy to grow though. Pretty easy to grow and at this spot I'm referring to, which could I could start some streams on that fairly soon. Uh, they have piles of coconuts here and there in composty areas that they've established and they are just going off and you can really see there the process of the coconuts as they start to, to sprout oh if the name of the movie if I recall the name of the movie I'd like to know yeah I'd, I, I need to go find that there were a few what I would call seminal is that a word let's use a different word that I actually know uh, that was important there were an important set of movies I watched is like these film strip you know old they bring in the old projector and show these movies one of them was the red balloon that that is another one like similar kind of idea where it, it follows the whole movie it's like a french movie where they follow a red balloon if you've seen that movie the red balloon you know what i mean almost no words and it's like in post-world war ii france it seems like yeah so like it's in the wreckage of a post apocalyptic dystopian recovery scenario and and it's this this balloon the red balloon i think that doesn't need to be that yeah i think this was like even earlier i might have watched that movie earlier than grade five and six but uh yeah so the red balloon the other one was this movie following the carved the carved kayak floating around the world and and there are definitely a, a couple others that were that were like that for me that just got me thinking about this is a big world <laughs> isn't this fun there's all kinds of places to explore I guess I've never lost that that uh, feeling you know which is why I'm standing in murky water <laughs> yeah that's 730 in the morning and loving it yeah I do miss the reel-to-reel -reel as well a little bit I've actually got a I did a lot of eight millimeter 
filming as a kid, which is interesting. Just a little history for the Eat Your Backyard world. When I was about, uh, I don't know, maybe 14 or so, I took my grandfather's old 8mm. You're 40 but nostalgic, big cat. Yeah, so he had an old 8mm... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say video camera, it's a filming camera, a couple of them. And he had taken lots of lots of uh, eight millimeter film of trips to Hawaii and all, all kinds of cool stuff. And it also my brother and sister, who are much older than I am, uh, the, I got to see them as kids doing things like swimming with dolphins. And I mean, amazing. So to me, it was magical and I, was in the window between air conditioning and death robots. <laughs> so are you. <laughs> in other words, I could still get eight millimeter film for the for the camera, but it was hard to come by, but I found spots and this is pre-internet, so you had to like call around and know someone who knew someone and knew a photo store that had it. And it was like the whole thing, but I ended up getting it. And then you had to find the place where you could go have it developed, you know, because you take this foot and then you get to have to take it and have it go developed. And then you have to put it in an eight millimeter projector, eight millimeter film projector that were also kind of hard to come by. But as a matter of fact, within my family, uh, there were three of them. So I actually burned through all three of them because the bulbs would die and then you couldn't find the bulbs. And I actually, I found a bulb for the last one, but, and used it for years. I still have that projector, I think, out in my garage. But I loved to use that 8mm camera. And one of the things I would do would be lay down flat on my skateboard. I was, loved to skateboard as a kid. Still do. I just don't like the feeling of getting injured for months now. But um, I would lay on my back and go down hills and have the 8mm on my stomach and do like that speed run down hills. And we did a lot of, a lot of different filming of it. So here we are, 2020 doing some version of it, a little bit more complicated. Same idea. Capture novelty, and I think I missed a couple comments. I'm gonna look back. Oh, thanks Roblox Nation Squad. Happy to make anybody's day. I appreciate that that's even can happen. You're in LA, Squids? Like Los Angeles, LA? Oh wow, your Uncle Rex gave you an 8mm camcorder. That's so cool. What a treasure that is. Yeah, yeah, got some you got some old footage, do you, big cat? Yeah. That's uh right, that's a that's a powerful thing. <laughs> what did they choose to film? You know, what was the object of attention for somebody in say 1962? You know, because that was some of the film strips I had was 1962. There's no voice, which is interesting. There's no audio, right? So I love that part of it. You've got to bring all that to it in your mind. You know, what were they saying? What was happening there? And the kind of herky-jerky movements they make because of the way the film happens. The, the camera I had, you actually hand-wound the camera. Actually, both of the cameras, the 8mm filming cameras I had you wound them up so there was no battery they're rechargeable by you but mechanically oh there you go you see that that was a white heron beautiful white heron looks somewhat like a stork oh, is this where we go Autobahn let's go Autobahn we go full Autobahn what do we have here oh that's a peregrine falcon look at that he sees something maybe he sees that horse crab about where it was. He smells it already, but he's probably not interested. If you're a pair of falcon, you don't have to settle for a rotten crab. Just go in and get a fresh mullet. A lot of times you'll see, if you can see over here, there's a whole bunch of dive bombing pelicans. They're on a school of mullet and they are just dismantling their 
their whole social structure. <laughs> yeah. I often think of the life of fish in this river, having spent so much time floating over, fishing for them, interacting with them, I think about these things. You know, swimming along, you know, is the life of a mullet peaceful or violent or whatever, you know, the moments I'm checking out are like as it's getting smashed by a giant fish or a pelican, but most of the life of a mullet is, is really just fine. You know, until that giant airborne monster comes and steals you away from everything you... But prior to that, it's a really peaceful, just swimming around, just pumping that tail. Yeah, and those pelicans. Had some good times with these pelicans. Uh, watched them for years fly over the waves, fly around in the river. They're one of my favorite birds. One time, one dove down on a finger mullet I had on a hook that was floating above the water, and I actually hooked the pelican, which I felt absolutely horrible about, so I quickly got it next to the boat and got it secured. Got the hook right out, but what I realized was it had like five other hooks inside its beak, <laughs> which was like really depressing, it, it kind of. So uh, we took out all the other hooks, but turned it kind of occurred to me this particular pelican he's making the same mistake over and over i don't know if they all make that mistake one thing they do is they come dive bombing down i mean like super fast right into the water and what actually happens to these to these beautiful brown pelicans is that over time their optical nerve starts to separate from their eye and they become somewhat blind and it becomes harder and harder for them to fish and I think that probably explains why they might at some point be dive bombing for fish that have, you know, that are hooked and aren't swimming naturally or whatever. But, you know, I, I would think with good vision, they're probably not making as many mistakes like that. Yeah, not a bad morning, not a bad morning. Well, I guess it's time to get on with phase two of the day. I hope you are ready to have a, a great day as well. I got one more question, uh, that famous girl. How did you take Hurricane Irma? We took it on the chin, took it like a champ. <laughs> we were very fortunate not to have much problem from any hurricanes lately. Um, but, you know, that could change at any minute. I love, we've been living in Florida now for over 25 years and uh, that you know as the whole COVID I was about to end it but I'm gonna just wax philosophic here for a second but as the whole COVID scenario happened uh, it felt very familiar to me and I don't know if other people in Florida had the same feeling but it felt like a hurricane it felt like the same oh this is another type of you know potential disaster that same kind of feeling now I'm not saying it's the same event. All I'm saying is that this idea of, oh, everything that you know may change here. I, I've never gotten used to that feeling, but I had that feeling. And it's very similar to like, oh, here comes Irma, or here, here comes Category 5 Hurricane. You know exactly, they're beautiful brown pelicans. But you know exactly what these hurricanes can do and what they've you know nearly done so many times before where they knock down everything in your yard, your fences, peel part of your roof off, whatever damage. But what they can actually do is turn your neighborhood into something like Homestead, which, you know, anybody I've had, I have friends who were living in Homestead during Hurricane Andrew. And one of them said, dude, you can't even understand what it was like. He said the next, when we went back, I was using a shovel to pick up my CDs. He had a big collection of audio CDs back in the 90s right and said that it, everything was just it was like a bomb went off and all of my stuff was everywhere all ruined I just, can you imagine that vision of having to shovel everything you own with a like a snow shovel type into garbage cans because it's all destroyed so I don't
Yeah, that's right. They're, they're gorgeous. That's a perfect point. There's nothing to complain about. <laughs> it's my point with the with the hurricanes is that, you know, you this exercise of going through that thought process over and over again, I guess you could stay stuck there. But for me, I just realized like, yeah, all of this, which is always the way it always was anyhow, which is that all of this is temporary. So yeah, don't get too attached. Put your value on what's important. Do what you can. Get serious when you have to, but don't take it too serious. And, uh, and uh, this is a beautiful place to live, so I've got nothing but gratitude. Nothing but. Yeah. So we went a little off the beaten track, but how do we handle Irma? Irma? Great. We're hoping one bigger one doesn't smash us next year, but wow, there sure were a lot of hurricanes this year. And uh, the Gulf uh, was transformed in a couple different ways this year because of it. So, yep. Hey, I'm happy that you all are on the stream. I hope you enjoyed it. And I'm going to go ahead and jump off, get started with the rest of the day. Stay tuned. I may live stream one more time this afternoon. Have a great day. Don't forget, eat your backyard. <laughs>